uh, an introduction, which we're so excited to have here. Uh, we were very fortunate to have such a great CODEL working for us in Washington, D.C., uh, and one of those champions who's been fighting for all this federal legislation. He's always fighting for North Dakota. You know that because he's uh, one of the most accessible uh, senators in America, and he's here to join us today to talk about uh, the uh, Main Street uh, <clears throat> Main Streets are hurting in the Main Street lending program uh, that the Federal Reserve has just announced and they're expanding the scope. And so again, I want to thank uh, Senator Kevin Kramer for being here and thanks for all you've done for North Dakota for all the years you've served our state. Great to have you here, Kevin. Thank you, Governor, um, for the opportunity. Thank you for your incredible leadership. One of the things I have to say that I um, have appreciated most about the job lately um, is that I get to get on national television a lot and talk about how great North Dakota is because everybody asks these curious questions like, how can the numbers be so low and why don't you have all these mandates that everybody else is doing? And I just get to talk about common sense, Trump's government mandates every time. And when you have a governor that understands you know, the federal guidelines and applies them to the context of the state he's running uh, in a common sense way with common sense people, it really works quite well. So thanks for your great leadership, um, Governor, as always. And before I get into the Main Street Lending Program, uh, you may have noticed just in the last, I don't know, hour, hour and a half, uh, CMS did make an announcement related to telehealth that I thought was great. I've been working with um, Secretary Azar on appropriate reimbursement for telehealth. And you know, this is a, a subject near and dear to all of our hearts here in, in rural America, and particularly in North Dakota. But just yesterday on a phone call, we were talking about expanding telehealth services and the reimbursement, CMS reimbursement at, at office visit rates, not only for video uh, conferencing, but for audio only. And so today they did announce an expansion of audio only telehealth uh, reimbursement at, um, at office visit and outpatient rates. So that's important not only for the patients, and it is very important for them, not everyone yet has good, good access to broadband and, and audio, uh, video services, um, but it's also important for our providers so that they have a means of, of you know, reimbursement that makes them, at least uh, allows them to be successful. So kudos to Secretary Azar and the Trump administration on that. Um, you, we've all been following for a long time. You all have been following for a long time, of course, the Paycheck Protection Program. And being a member of the banking committee, it was, it was an interesting heavy lift to see that through to legislation, to finality. And now as we've been, as it's been implemented in a second tranche now has been um, both authorized and appropriated to see how it's worked. And, and it seems like a lot of times it's felt like a, a moving goalposts, and that's because it has been. That's because it's, it passed quickly. It was $350 billion in the first tranche, uh, about $310 billion in the second tranche. Uh, God love our, our bankers, our credit unions, our independent community bankers, our, the North Dakota Bankers Association. The Bank of North Dakota governor has played a leading role in, in organizing uh, our institutions to the point where after tranche one of paycheck protection, North Dakota led the nation, again, no surprise, in, in the per capita loans. We, had, uh, we issued 1,102 loans to, um, to the tune of just over $1.5 billion dollars and that results in about $140,000 per loan. So that, that, that was a, a remarkable feat, and that is a credit to, um, to, our, to our lending institutions. Today, well, let, let me back up just a little bit. I think you also all know that I've been spending a lot of my time and, and effort on the oil industry and, and the, the problems, the deep valley that our oil and gas, our oil independence, our energy independence, um, the vulnerability of it is, is in. And so um, the collapse of, of price and um, the, the escalating of potential bankruptcies and loss of, of small producers and the value chain up and down the oil and gas industries is a real problem. And, and on the one hand, we fought vigorously through my role on, on the uh, um, Defense uh, Committee, Senate Armed Services Committee, uh, in dealing with adversaries and allies alike, uh, it, particularly on the supply side. On the financing side, this is a particularly major challenge for small producers. And that's important to remember, because the one thing we do not need and do not want, we've, the, the, the Ag Commissioner and I are talking about the vulnerability of our food supply chain with, with the concentration of, of meatpacking and so few players, especially global players. 
Well, the same is true in the industry, in, in, in the oil and gas industry. We do not want a half a dozen oil companies surviving at the end of this and watching capital follow where capital gets the best return as opposed to considering America's national security interests. That's where we're heading if we don't have some sort of financial credit tools to help our small producers in the value chain upstream and downstream survive this valley, a bridge to the other side so that when demand comes back, and it will, and when the prices come up with that demand, and it will, um, that we still have some producers and some providers and some service sector companies that are still standing at the end of this. So we've been working with Secretary Mnuchin, uh, who I talk to at least a couple times a week, I suppose, Secretary Bruyer, of course, the, the uh, Energy Secretary, uh, Chairman Powell, Jay Powell, the Federal, uh, um, Federal Reserve Chairman. And this week, they've been working really, really hard on coming up with some part of the 13 3 uh, credit tools that the Federal Reserve has, 13.3 being the emergency lending programs. One of those program, programs, of course, is the Main Street Lending Program. They came out with interim rules not long ago. Uh, the program fits a lot of uses for, for small to mid-sized companies, but not all of them. One of the challenges for the oil and gas industry is, well, there are a couple of them. One of them is the rating, the, the rating um, design in, in the, uh, in the uh, qualifications. The rates, the, the, their setting for, for, their, uh, for their rating was effective March 22nd. They had to have like a triple B minus or better, which is an investment grade rating. And of course, we all know that the, the, the price war between Saudi Arabia and Russia started on March 6th. We saw price collapse that went from $42 to $31 in one day, and then down to $20 like the next day. And so their standing, their, their, their standing for credit worthiness was greatly dim diminished by this price war that is not any fault of theirs on top of the lower demand based on as a result of COVID-19. So that and then the fact that the, the Main Street um, lending program also required at least two rating agencies to rate them at, at this credit worthiness level. Big problem that, that basically, basically kicks out a lot of our companies. The other thing that kicks out a lot of our companies from the other programs is the fact that they are affiliated with private equity firms, and that means that their, their employee base is greater than 500, even though they may only have 75 employees in the oil patch, and uh, that kicks them out of the Paycheck Protection Program. So what's the, the, the long and short of that is today, the uh, Federal Reserve announced an expansion of Main Street Lending Program to encompass much more of the type of business that I'm talking about, and that is the highly leveraged business. Many of our companies, this is where, this is where a company like Whiting or Oasis, and, and I probably shouldn't even name companies, but companies that do business in North Dakota, smaller companies, and, and even a lot of the service companies, they're very leveraged. They don't have the type of cash that a very large multinational company would have. And so when they see a collapse and they see availability of credit diminished, they're in a lot of trouble. So this, the Main Street Lending Program um, changed, they added another component that allows lenders to retain a 15% share on the loans. It's otherwise been 5%. That just makes the loans a little bit easier to do. Um, the, uh, the lenders will be able to apply their industry-specific expertise. This is a big one because one size never fits all. And local bankers that understand the industry that they're lending to, not just industry, but the actual borrower, really, really critical. That's included in this to help measure the, the borrower's income. Um, it also includes businesses of up to 15,000 um, employees or up to $5 billion in revenue. It, previously, it was 10,000 employees and, and uh, $2.5 billion in revenue. So, so just in, it just includes, encompasses a lot more a lot more uh, borrowers, and I don't want to say it was custom designed for um, the oil and gas industry, but it definitely is able to capture a lot more of the oil and gas industry into these important, um, somewhat more benevolent funding programs, financing programs, than it did, uh, than it did previously. So gr I'm grateful to President Trump. He and I have talked about this many times. Um, very grateful to Energy Secretary uh, Dan Brillet, who um, we talked to on multiple times a week, um, Secretary Mnuchin, again, Jay Powell, and uh, the entire economic team at the White House for coming up with this program that should help many of our producers stay alive till the other side when the demand and the price come back up. Thank you, Governor. 
Thank you, Senator Kramer, and uh, thank you again for fighting for uh, all sectors of the North Dakota economy.